All right, so who cares what day it is? We're going to be talking about chemical equilibrium for a good chunk of the rest of the class. Um, this first chapter is the basics of it, the concepts. The next couple of chapters are just some pretty specific and very important applications of it. Um, split up this chapter in about three lessons. So for this first lesson, you're going to be able to describe the nature of chemical equilibrium and how it's related to reaction rates that we just studied. Um, we're going to use rate laws to construct this new thing called an equilibrium constant expression. And we're going to calculate numerically equilibrium constants for and concentrations for various systems. And toward the end, you're going to be able to describe you know, the equilibrium constant and use it to see if something actually is at equilibrium or if it's still reacting spontaneously. And finally, um, we're going to learn about something called the Chatelier's principle, um, which predicts the effects of changes to equilibriums and how um, in which way a system will react spontaneously to reachieve equilibrium. So by the time this lesson's over, this will make sense to you. Um, we've got one liter container, two moles of A, four moles of B. Um, at equilibrium, we have 0.4 moles of D. And you're going to tell me the equilibrium constant, and you're going to tell me how much of everything else is in there. Believe it or not. And another thing we'll get to is something like this. You'll understand what this means. Barium fluoride sparingly soluble salt dissolves into barium and fluoride ions. And at equilibrium, if the fluoride concentration is 0.0126 molar, and there's some undissolved solid, what is the equilibrium constant for that reaction? All right, so recap. We talked about thermodynamics a bit last semester, and that told you whether um, something will give off energy or give you some idea of whether it's going to react spontaneously. In later chapters, we will develop that concept a lot more completely. We just talked about kinetics, and that will tell you how fast a reaction will occur and describe it. Um, chemical equilibrium tells you the extent to which a reaction will occur. So, so far, um, you've been talking about reactions that essentially go to completion. Um, that basically all of the non-limiting reactant gets consumed, and you make the stoichiometrically expected amount of products based on how much of the non-limiting reactant you, um, you had. And it turns out that that is not always the case. In fact, it's often not the case. And sometimes the reaction just doesn't completely run, that you still got some amounts of all of the reactants and have made some amount of all of the products. So let me give you an example of that. Okay, so this is some hypothetical reactions that are quite simple, one, rea one reactant and one product. And here what I've got is Um, so again, each one of these represents a different reaction, A to B, C to D, all that stuff. And I've got, for some, I've got a couple different trials, and I've got just one of this uh, E to F reaction here. And what I have listed here are the initial concentrations of the reactants in the products. I've got the measured equilibrium, I'm sorry, reaction rate constants, note little k. Um, for the forward and the reverse reactions. And on top of that, I've got the concentrations of both of these that were measured at equilibrium. Now, um, if you have the student version of the PowerPoints available, now is a good time to get that out because you will be referring to this chart. If not, stop, get it print it out or bring it up on the screen next to you or do something so you can look at it. And I'm going to have you answer a couple of questions about this data. So with that data in hand, let's answer these questions. So the first one is, do the four systems have the same final equilibrium composition? And that one's easy. No, they're all different. 
The next question is, if you look at one system in particular, does the final equilibrium composition depend on the initial composition? And so there are, of those four, there are three um, that have two runs. They always have different initial compositions, initial concentrations. So the initial ones are different, but the final ones are the same. So our formal answer is no, it doesn't seem to depend on the initial composition. And what's up with that? So let's talk about this for a sec here. All right, so let's just consider one of them and we'll start with the first one, A going to B. So let's hypothetically, hypothetically start with um, pure A, only A, and think about what would happen as time progressed with that system. And you would see something like this, that, again, because you've only got A and it's a reactant, you've got a high initial concentration and it will start to drop. As that happens, B is produced, so its concentration starts at zero but increases. Now, at some point, the concentration of both of these stop changing. They are not equal, but they are at this point at least constant. And how does that happen? Okay, so let's remember that um, this is an equilibrium, so you can assign an independent or indifferent rate constant for the forward and the reversed um, reaction. And the, the condition that has to be met for these concentrations to remain constant is that the rates of the forward and reverse reactions have to be equal. Now, remember that this is a dynamic equilibrium, which means that you know, this conversion of A going to B might be going on billions of times a second, but that the actual numbers of A and B in your system at that point um, no longer change. So the system, again, is reacting primarily in the forward direction. Um, and then at some point, the rate of the forward reaction, the forward reaction and the reverse reaction equal out. And what would that be math-wise? Well, again, if we assume first order kinetics, we can say that the rate of the first order is just, of the forward reaction is just gonna be Kf times the concentration of A. And the rate of the reverse reaction is just gonna be Kr times the concentration of B. And in math speak, you're gonna say this, the Kf times the equilibrium concentration of A equals Kr times the equilibrium concentration of B, whatever those might happen to be. All right, so here's our result. And let's play around with this oh, a little bit more. So we could figure, you know, we could ask ourselves, what is the ratio of the equilibrium concentration of B to the equilibrium concentration of A? And that's pretty straightforward algebra. So equilibrium B over equilibrium A would just be Kf over Kr. Now this is a very, very important result because Kf and Kr are themselves constant. And the quotient of two constants is still a constant. Which means that this too will also be a constant. And this is this is important and something that you know the opening set of data didn't quite um, point out well enough that the actual individual concentrations of A and B aren't necessarily the same. 
um, or aren't always going to be the same, but their ratio always will be. Now, it's a little beyond the scope of this class, but um, the idea is that the equilibrium expression can be determined from balanced chemical equation just like we did before. So the reason why that last example worked out so cleanly is we made an assumption about first order kinetics. Um, and if you are decided to be a chemistry major and take physical chemistry, you will learn exactly why. For some general reaction, little a a plus little b b gives us little c c and little d d. I say that a bunch of times that the equilibrium constant expression can be would be equal to the concentrations of the products raised to the power of their coefficient divided by the concentration of the reactants their coefficient and this capital KC, all right, um, now technically, again, you learn in PCAM, all of these concentration terms are actually divided by a standard concentration, which so conveniently enough was described or defined as being one molar, so the numbers don't change. And this is done before you raise it to the power, which means that technically these equilibrium constants KC are unitless. So a couple of things you will note uppercase K. Um, this is to distinguish this equilibrium constant from the aforementioned rate constants. Now they are, again, the this equilibrium constant is a product quotient, depends on, depending on the stoichiometry, this is built essentially from the rate constants for the forward and reverse reactions. All right. And expressions like this um, can allow you to do a lot of um, predictive calculations as well. So here's what we tend to use this for. 